All right. So this uh, today's lecture is going to be the the extension of what we did last time about oscillations. All right. But before we move on to that and eventually introduce to you what are waves and what are the relationship of waves that it have with what we studied last time about oscillations. There's one last stop that I want to mention about, which is the damped oscillation, right? So when you have damped oscillation, the scenario gets a little bit more realistic because, I mean, when you go back and think about that mass on that spring, I mean, don't you forget, like, usually we're going to have to deal with friction all the time. Yeah. So, okay. So let me recap what we did. And something was so powerful last time was you started everything from sigma f equal to ma, right? So that's what you did. So you said sigma f equal to ma. So the Newton's law started out there. And then you said there's only one force acting on the, the, the mass, which is a spring from Hooke's law. So you say it's a negative kx equal to, and then you set acceleration to be the second derivative of the displacement. And then we learned how to solve this differential equation. And then we said the only function that is going to be solution to this equation is the sinusoidal in behavior. So it means something is going to behave periodically. So that's why we said, okay, it's either sine or cosine. And what we had there was just like a general form that can cover all cases possible in this kind of oscillations. So we said we arrived at the general solution, all right, which will be able to take care of all the cases in this world. Okay. But anyway, the point is, Bodan, why don't you impose some friction on it to make it a little bit more real? So yeah, of course, if you have friction, you can add that negative mu n, which is the friction on the floor to it. But having this negative mu n, it's quite okay. And doesn't make your differential equation more complicated that much because mu is a constant and n is supposed to be constant because you probably say n is just mg. So if you, I mean, for those of you that already taken the calculus two or differential equation courses, you guys know that by adding just a constant to the differential equation does not change the shape of the solution. All right, so it means you still get the sinusoidal wave anyway, but I mean, the characteristic is going to have some additional stuff on it. But then we want to study something that has, you know, something cool. <laughs> okay. All right, we want something like, hey, there is something that worth discussing. So instead of introducing just like a fixed constant into your differential equation, I am interested in another kind of resistance. Let me call it like maybe like a, it's not a friction on the floor anymore, but it's kind of a resistive force. For example, look at the scenario on the left, guys. So now we have the same mass on the spring, but now we put it in a vertical direction. And now the mass is now it's immersed inside some liquid, for example. All right. Now you can imagine that, of course, if you pull the mass down, let it go, it's going to move up and down, up and down, but eventually it's going to stop. And this one is the same thing as you having a friction, all right? But now it's more like a, it's like a fluid resistance instead of just like a, 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 a contact resistance. But anyway, why do, I am just, uh, why do we are interested in this? The reason is because the resistive force that you can impose over here, now we can give it like an, an, an extra condition or I mean some particular condition on this resistance. Let's say if this resistance depending on the velocity of the mass. And this one is very realistic because if you imagine you do like a, um, the, the parachute jumping or you do like jumping out from the airplane like you saw in the movie. So at first, of course, you, you I mean, let's say that the, the air around you is just still air. So the air doesn't move. There's no big wind blowing or anything. Let's say it's very calm. The air is kind of like, okay, this is very good day, sunny day and everything. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. So when you jump down, at first, your initial velocity, let's say, is zero. So at that time, you don't feel anything. You don't feel air blowing to your face or anything, right? So that's why you can say at the moment that you still don't have any speed or velocity, you still don't feel any resistive force. Okay. But now, of course, your gravity is pulling you downward. 
and then you're going to move faster and faster. But then you will feel that the more, the faster you move, then it seems like the force that hitting your face is getting stronger and stronger, right? You feel like there's a wind blowing against you or something like that. So that's why this assumption over here is very realistic, all right? And actually is being used to describe the motion inside like a, some fluids, for example. So that means I can turn this, uh, turn this relationship into an equation and then say the resistance is just some constant multiplied by the velocity or speed. Sounds like a good a a a relationship here, yeah? All right, so that means that constant B that you put in here can be representing, for example, the viscosity of the fluid. Does that make sense to you? So that means if that B is big, so it means you are moving inside something that's so viscous, like maybe like a honey or something like that. You pull the mass down, you let it go. It's just like, mm, cannot move very easily. Yeah. <clears throat> but then of course, if you have a small B, that could be just like air or it could be just like, I don't know, something very light. You can still move in there very easily, but you feel a little bit of resistance. Okay. So that means what you have over here is now I can put this term in here. And that's what we have here. That's your resistance. And don't forget, you need the negative sign to represent the directions. It's a resistance. So it means it's going to point backward with respect to the direction of motion. All right. So why do we have this in here? The reason is because it makes it so beautiful in the sense that the speed or the velocity that you see over here is the first derivative of displacement. And that gives you another type well, it's not another type, it's, it's still the second order differential equation anyway, but now you pretty much have all the terms, including the second order, the first order, and the zero order term in this equation. Okay, and of course, as I already told you, we are not trying to do too much math over here. And if you want, you can refer to calculus textbook and then just take a look at how you can solve this one, maybe using integrating variable on and on. But my point is this, naturally, what you're thinking that is about to happen is, all right, so if you don't have any resistance at all, and you start from point A, that which is your amplitude, then you set it in motion, that oscillation will happen up and down, up and down, okay, don't talk about the frequency at this point, I'm just writing down, talking about the amplitude here. So what you're seeing here is like your oscillation will keep going forever because there's no resistance, so that's it, all right? However, in this case, because you already have some resistance, so what you can expect is your amplitude supposed to get lower and lower in time. See, it's dying down. And the good thing about this particular term it uh, presenting here is the function that the amplitude dying down is very familiar it turns out it's exponential in nature. And the reason for that exponential decay is because you are dealing with the first order term right here, okay? So what you have, this is all you need to know. It's just like, okay, John, this is more realistic in the sense that once you apply the resistive force, and if that resistive force, depending on the speed of the mass, then your amplitude is reduced in time and it's exponential decay. Okay, that's all I need. I mean, I need you to know. We don't have this in the exam or anything, but I think this is something that I think that's kind of nice to know. Why? Look at this. If we dig a little bit deeper, I was talking about like, hey, John, that B over there can tell you about how viscous your medium or your, your environment is, right? And now think about it. If it's not that viscous, you pull the mass down, let it go. It's going to oscillate up and down with the diminishing amplitude. So what you're getting over here is going to be the blue curve on the bottom curve over here. We call this an under damp, under damp, oh, under, under pet, sorry, <laughs> under damped oscillation. Okay. So it just means it, it's damped, but it's still, you know, I mean, not, not a lot. So this means you can still see the Ill oscillatory behavior. However, the amplitude is decreasing. On the other hand, in the case that you have a super, super, super viscous fluid. So once you pull it down, let it go, it's just like, eh, 
it doesn't want to go. So you are getting the black curve right here. So you start from the starting point and then let it go. It doesn't show up the oscillatory behavior anymore because it's too viscous for this mass to oscillate in front of you. So what you have over here is we call this scenario the overdamped oscillation. Cool. So what's the point of that? So the point is the black curve will not, it doesn't give you frequency anymore. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Okay. All right. So when they look at the, the underdamped oscillation, you can still define the frequency. But when you look at the overdamped, there's no more frequency because it doesn't even complete like a single cycle or anything. Okay. But the most crucial part is this. Do you notice something in this curve here, in the bottom curve, the plots here? We have the third curves. You see this? The red one. Now you must see if somehow you, I mean, you want to compare between the underdamped and overdamped. It depends on the viscosity of the medium, right? So that means there must be some sort of like a borderline or some sort of like a crossover that you can move or you can, you know, change from underdamped to overdamped. So there must be some sort of like a, you know, some you know, transition or condition, whatever, that you change from one to the other. And that is the red line right there. We say this is called critically, critically damped oscillation. Okay, so it's critical. It's critical in the sense that beyond this point, you're going from under damped to over damped. So it means you're not going to see the oscillation anymore. But notice the red curve here. What is so cool about the rate curve? The rate curve, actually, if you aim that these three curves try to approach zero, the red one get down to zero very quickly. Isn't that cool? Okay. Oh, no, no sad, no sad. This is good. Okay. <laughs> so what you have over here is, this is exactly what you want when you want to control something and want and I want, and you want things to get to the equilibrium point as quickly as possible. Can you sort of like think of something that needs this kind of property? Yeah, maybe you are sort of like a suspension or choke up in your car, right? For example, every time that you ride a car and then you hit the bump, then of course your car will oscillate a little bit. The choke up will smooth things out a little bit, right? But then you have to tune the stiffness of that spring right, that connect to the wheels and everything to make sure that, hey, your car will actually, you know, get back to the equilibrium, uh, equilibrium point as quickly as you, I mean, that will be the most efficient way to get back to the equilibrium point. So that's when you want to tune the stiffness of the spring to be critically damped condition. Does that make sense? Yeah, F1, yeah. <laughs> okay, I think but the road in the F1 circuit is kind of smooth, yeah. Or another one, is like a, a swinging door, right? I mean, if you look at the, the, it's not, I don't think it's called automatic, right? but the door, that's soft closed, okay? So when you open the door, they might have like some hydraulic system or whatever. <clears throat> and then when you open the door, it's supposed to close back to the original position, right? Of course, to save some energy, you don't want the air conditioner to work too hard or anything. You want the doors to be closed as quickly as possible. So think about it, if you tune whatever the hydraulic, which means like the, the whole thing that hold the door too soft, then the door will spin back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for a long time before it eventually get to the I mean, stopping point or equilibrium point. Or on the other hand, I mean, you go like, you know, super, I mean, super stiff or whatever. Then when you let it go, it's just like, it takes a long, long time, right? So that's exactly right. So absorption chalk used for rallying yes <laughs> so anything that you use as like a shock absorber or to soften thing or you know slow close or whatever i think you need or I mean, you might not need it but to be most efficient you would love to fit or to set or to config that system to be in the clinic critically damped oscillation because you know after hitting some changes and everything it will try to reach the equilibrium point as quickly as possible right not over them take too long not under them it's going to oscillate back and forth you want it to be along the red curve cool 
All right, guys, that's what okay. I want you to at least get a little bit of the oscillations in the topic of damped oscillation without doing any detailed calculations. I think this is good enough. All right, we don't want to sort of like, you know, burden you too much with mathematics. All right, but in the textbook, they still have a lot of stuff in there. All right, but anyway, and I think uh, this is a, a good point to say, hey, this is it, guy, done for the oscillations. And I think I already made my point how powerful the Newton's law is, right? Everything just starting from sigma f equal to ma. You get all the, just a regular simple harmonic motion. And now you even get got the damped oscillations with all three cases. Unbelievable. Yeah. All right, guys. Okay. So that's done for the oscillations. So what the story today then? Oh, what's that? Just a funny bit on what happened if you got no damped. <laughs> All right, that's kind of nice. All right, guys, just check that YouTube out. <laughs> Don't watch in class. <laughs> Thanks for the uh, uh, sort of like um, additional materials. <laughs> cool. All right, guys. So what else do we need? All right, what else do we need? So it turns out the connections that I wanted from oscillation is waves. Actually, back in the day, we were talking about waves right away as according to the maybe like a uh, old version of the syllabus. We have waves right after thermodynamics. But then after a while, I think people just got confused or it's not even got confused. It's like it's lose some connections a little bit because we jump right into waves too soon. So that's why we insert <laughs> sort of like squeeze in the topics of oscillation, yeah? Okay. Just so you have some familiarity with the sinusoidal function and you understand how to get to the simple harmonic motion through differential equation. But now it's time for waves. And of course, if I wanna start with like a dumb question, what are waves, guys? All right, you, know, you guys gonna go whatever. <laughs> All right, I mean, the answer will be so long. The idea is this, let's talk about waves. What are the key components if you really want to generate waves? So first of all, I mean, maybe the easiest kind of wave that you can see is maybe just a wave on the water surface, for example. And you can see that to generate this kind of waves, what you do is you just, I mean, disturb the water. I mean, you look at like, maybe you have like a, a pond or you have like, a, I don't know, on the uh, still water and then you just drop something into the water, then you generate a ripple. Yeah, and that ripple just keep expanding. So you need to disturb the water to generate waves. That's the whole point. So to be able to generate wave, you need three things. And the first of all, you need the source. You have to disturb it first, okay? Without a disturbance, then there's no source. So there's no source, there's no waves, okay? And the second of all, we need the medium. And because we are still looking at the mechanical waves, Right. We still have like another class of waves, which is electromagnetic, which is not here yet. So we're still talking about mechanical waves because we made the connections with Newton's law. So that means it's still, you need, still need medium anyway. Okay. So you have the source of disturbance, you have a medium, and then this is, to me, I think this is the most important. You need some sort of like the, the, the mechanism that adjacent portions inside that medium can pretty much interact with each other. So that means when one portion of the medium moves, the adjacent portion will feel the move and then it will start to, to move. And then when the next one start to move, the next next one feel the move and start to move. And when the next next one move, the next 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 one feel the move and start to move <laughs> on and on, right? So this whole thing, it's just like when you do the human waves on the like stadium and all this stuff, right? So you guys sort of like know the rule. If your friend next to you stand up, then next is going to be you that has to stand up. And then the friends next to you will later stand up. And then you create the you know, human waves across the stadium and all this stuff, right? Of course, I mean, you're not going to get any waves if you don't want to play this, <laughs> right? So it's like, okay, you stand up. I don't care. I don't want to stand up. So that means you lose the interaction between your adjacent elements in the medium. Cool. All right. So that's why that connection is the key components for you to generate waves. And that is the reason why there is source 
And later, there will be a propagation of that disturbance from the source position. And that propagation of the disturbance, that can be used as a definition of waves. So that's why I put it up here. It's a propagation of disturbance. You disturb something and that disturbance does not stay localized. It gets distributed out. <laughs> so everyone knows. Yeah. All right. So that's kind of like three components for you to generate waves. All right. And I think you start to see the connections. Why do we have to learn oscillations a little bit to help the whole thing? Because if you generate the source of disturbance in like a regular manner, I mean, there's some oscillatory behavior up and down, up and down, up and down. The propagation of the disturbance will be up and down, up and down, up and down. And that's when you can generate like a very, very regular shape waves. It's cool. So that means the oscillations that you learn can eventually be used as a source to generate waves. So that's the connections right there. And you will see clearly today, why do we need the simple harmonic motion? All right. But anyway, come back to our waves first. If you want to classify types of waves, you can classify in terms of the direction of motion of the elements inside the medium with respect to the propagation direction. Okay, slowly guys, look at this. So we use spring in this case because it's so easy. You can move your hand up and down. So it's mean now your hands being moved up, down, but then, of course, the propagation of the disturbance will go in the horizontal direction, right? Because that's where the wave is going to traveling out. So this is the wave direction, okay? Because now, because what you have over here is the source or your hands is moving perpendicular to the wave's motion direction, we're going to name this type of wave the transverse wave, okay? So on the other hand, you can do it differently, but that instead of moving your hands up or down, you can move in and out, okay? So that means your direction of your hand is parallel to the propagation of wave's direction. So when you move your hand in and out, in and out, so you have the region of the spring that get compressed and decompressed, compressed, decompressed, compressed, decompressed. But that compressed and decompressed will eventually get transferred or move along the spring, okay? So in that case, the wave's direction and the direction of movement of the source are parallel to each other. In that case, you have longitudinal waves. All right, but good news, guys. Okay. Doesn't matter. The mathematics that you will eventually use to explain these two types are exactly the same. I don't care. So I can just tell you right now, like spoiler alert over here. <laughs> It's easy because think of it this way. If I move my hand up and down in simple harmonic motion, we already learned from last time. I don't care if this simple harmonic will happen along the Y direction or it's going to be simple harmonic motion in the X direction. They are using the same types or the same form of the function. Okay? Okay. So that's good. So the mathematics that you are going to learn today is going to be able to apply it to all cases, either transverse or longitudinal waves, right? However, to be less ambiguity, uh, less ambiguous, we are going to pretty much focus on the transverse because it's so obvious, right? One is in the Y direction and the wave is traveling in the X direction. So we don't make too many mistakes along the way. <laughs> all right, but just so you know, that the mathematical tools that we are going to learn today can be applied to longitudinal waves as well. Cool? All right, but we are going to stick with the transverse most of the time because, all right, one is in X, one is in Y. So every time we say, hey, transverse velocity, you know it's you're going along the Y direction. And if you talk about the wave velocity, you know it's along the X direction. Cool? All right. Now, well done. All right, too much introduction right now. <laughs> I need something realistic. I need something that I can grab or I need something technical. I want some technicality today, yeah? <laughs> Here we go. Let me start with this simple question and let's see if you can answer me, okay? Focus on this curve. If somehow this is a snapshot of my pulse, there is a wave pulse, 
So when I say it's a pulse, it's mean it's just like a one, one, one bit of waves or one piece of waves. It's not like continuous waves or anything. It's just like I just move my hands up and down once, and that's it. I'm done. I generate one pulse of waves. Cool. All right. But anyway, I just take a snapshot. Bam. And this is the figure of the wave, let's say at time zero. This is my initial time. And somehow I can map this shape into a function. So this means I can write this one down perfectly. Y is a function of X. All right. So that means I know this is F of X, this shape right here. I know exactly. But because this wave has to travel, don't forget waves cannot stop. I don't know, have you ever seen waves stop before? <laughs> okay. Which is not possible because we said it's a propagation of the disturbance. So it has to need to it propagate. It cannot stop. So once you create it, it keep going <laughs> forever. <laughs> right? Of course, I mean, your amplitude might be just go to zero on and on. But the point is waves cannot be stopped. It has to move all the time. Here comes the question. Ooh. Give me the wave at any time t. What should be the function that representing this wave at time t? Well, Dan, don't think too much. You just slide to the right. <laughs> it's right there. All right. Okay, guys. Staring at this one. Do you get it? So wave has to travel, right? So at time t, it was right on the y-axis. The cent I mean, the, the peak of the wave is right on the y-axis. But later on, it will travel to the right. And I just write it down here. It looks like this. Do you get it? Why? All right. So if not, I'm going to show you right now what I'm doing over here by asking you something quite, I think you will get this one. I mean, you already got this one before. So. Imagine this, guys. So I have, okay, let me draw like a X, Y plane first. Here we go. So just start from something simple. I have like a straight line 45 degree angle. So everyone knows this one is just like Y equal to X. No big deal with that. Let's say I have another curve. Look like this. It's just exactly Y equal to X, but I translate this curve to my right side and let's say the distance I slide out is A. So what is the green line over there function here? What is the form, the function for the green line? You say, oh, John, that's fine. It's, uh, well, it's Y intercept. Turns out to be, now, okay, let me extend out here a little bit. Y intercepts right there is just going to be negative A. So it's going to be X minus A. You guys with me? So far is it good? Okay. Do the same thing if I translate this curve to my left with the distance B, let's say. So I set it in there. What is going to be the function for that blue curve? You say, okay, the Y intercept is now positive B. So the blue curve is Y equal to X plus B. Yeah. So equation of a straight line, Y equal to MX plus the Y intercept. Everything is perfect. Let's do something more acrobatic just a little bit. So instead of just looking at just a straight line, let's say if I have a parabolic curve, when y equal to x squared, just make it more fancy, all right? I can put some constants in the front, let's say 3x squared, doesn't matter. And then I translate this parabolic curve to my right by a distance a. What is the equation of the green parabolic curve? This might annoy you. Very nice. Very nice. 3x plus a, the whole thing squared. But then you translate to the right. So it turns out instead of plus, you need to do the minus instead. You guys with me here? The reason for that is because if you notice and if you want to compare some heights, some value of y, for example. The function in the, I mean, that you got from the red one happens right where, where this one is. 
And for the green, it's going to happen wherever this one is. But the value of the function for the green will be exactly the same as when it has to subtract back by the distance a. <laughs> Does that make sense? All right, so that means if you shift your curve to your right side, positive x direction, you have to change the x into x minus a, just like this. See that now? See the connections here? So that means if you decided to move your parabolic curve to your left and the distance travel is b, now you can say that your blue curve, your blue parabolic curve will be 3x plus b, the whole thing squared. Cool. Okay. All right. So this is what we have back in the day of learning functions. And then you have like, you know, left, right translation, up, down translation. What would you do with the original function? Why? But that's not what I want. <laughs> what I want is this, guys. Here. I want an animation. I don't want a fixed translation like we just discussed. I want the curve to travel in front of me, like an animation, and just something constantly move. All right. So what I really want is, let's say, if I start just with that parabolic curve again, let's say, all right, so I just bring back my parabolic curve. All right, this now, let's say y equals to x squared. But now I want this parabolic curve to actually move with some constant speed to my right. So it's mean it's going to just is it going. <laughs> okay. Okay. How are you going to do it? I want an animation because that animation eventually will be used to represent actual waves because wave never stop. It's going to travel at some speed. Well, Dan, um, well, that's doable. The reason it's doable because of this. Let's say if we know already when the distance travel being delta x, let's say, your function now will look like x minus delta x squared. You guys with me, yeah? <laughs> What's that count three? All right, but anyway, so what you have over here is now the green curve is just a rate curve shifted to the right by the distance of delta x, correct? Cool, to my right. Okay, but then I don't want this delta x to be a fixed value. I want it to move with time, with the speed v. So I say about John, yeah, distance equal to speed multiplied by time. With me, guys? So all I need to do is just plug that thing in. And what I have is x minus vt squared, and I'm done. Okay. So now you see, I hope you see my point. My whole point right now is, hey guys, every time from now on in your life, if you have a function that has a form of x minus vt built into your equation or in your function, it is representing an animation. It's moving in time. Isn't that cool? <laughs> wow. Right? And the negative side there is the symbol saying that, hey, my wave or my function is actually animated to my right side, positive x direction. So if equally well, if you want to have this parabolic curve travel to your left with some speed v, what is going to be, guys? All right, y equal to x plus vt, the whole thing squared. So now the sign between x and t will give you the direction of motion, okay? And now I hope coming back here, no problem, Madan. Okay. I got it. Whatever the shape of this curve is, all I need to do is just turn this x into x minus vt. It is the way that I can get this one animated. So this pulse will travel to my right-hand side with the speed v, and I am done. Okay. Cool. All right, so this is the first step to what we are going to do today. So let's conclude. This is what we have. Whenever you have function that looks like x minus vt or x plus vt, 
that is the wave traveling in the positive x and negative x direction respectively cool that's done but then you do notice something here this is representing something moving all the time so that's why hey let's call this wave function and now this is the time that i'm going to ask you to think back for those of you that took physics back in high school before i don't know have you ever noticed that once you study about waves things get complicated out of nowhere i don't know i know you feel like me or not but back in the day it's like hey seems like when i studying a wave there are stuff that i have to be worried about all the time and now i here comes i hope i demystify that one see this and this so it's a function of two variable guys welcome to two variable function okay so i would say maybe this is the only place in physics high school physics or maybe even the first year physics that you have to deal with two variables function okay let's forget about quantum physics at this point let's say in mechanics so maybe this is the only place in mechanics that you have to deal with two variable function which is space and time so that's why things are complicated because you have to think in two dimensions two dimensions mean in two ways it's either in space x or in time t in space x right not tesla space x okay anyway the point is the only place that you're going to deal with really really deal with this kind of x and t together is probably like relativity theory right from einstein's and other stuff but of course in mechanics it's just newtonian mechanics this is it this is the part that make this subject i mean this particular topics complicated and this get back to our original stuff over here guys from now on every time you read a textbook or a pdf that doesn't have any animation on it and you try to draw a wave on a paper on a tablet or whatever this figure that you are seeing over here must be a snapshot of a real wave you got what i'm saying over okay. here okay no need to clap here okay <laughs> right because now the conclusion that i have for you right now is waves never stop once you disturb something you generate a wave wave propagated out it will keep continue going forever never stop the only way that you can capture that wave and put it on a piece of paper over here it means you have to take a photo <laughs> and every time you want to take a photo it means you have to freeze the time you guys with me but speak in terms of the two function uh, two variable function what does it mean by freezing the time it's just you just pick the time guys t equal to something and that something is fixed so you can call t equal to zero t is five minutes t is one hour doesn't matter but once you fix the time the time components in your function disappear it turns into just a number and you will be left with just y as a function of space x and that's when you get wave form okay cool all right so that's the key point that i want you to keep in mind that hey waves never stop so the only th way that we can look at it do the analysis on paper on the textbook on the screen you must at least specify the time you take a snapshot put it on the paper and whatever you get just f of x single variable cool all right so i hope i give you just an introduction of whatever things that we have just for you know get things started and we're going to roll on this after the break but before that let's do a quick test do you understand what i'm talking up to this point <laughs> or do you understand this course at all <laughs> it's been like almost a month already all right so at time zero a transverse pulse in a wire is described by the following function x and y are in meters and everything is good write the function y of x t see is two variables function that describes this pulse if it's traveling in the positive x direction that's good with the speed given 4.5 meter per second go ahead Ooh. of course it's done Najan.
y equal to 6 over, wait, we got it, ready for it, x, positive x direction, so it's going to be minus, speed times time, everything stay exactly the same, and you are done. Okay. That's it. If you got this one, then I mean you got it. It is that simple. Okay, and it's a function of x and t. One more. Here we go. A pulse is moving along x-axis and is described by, I don't care, whatever function it is. Why x is in meter and t is in second, but do you notice something is x plus or minus something t? Whoa. So what you're seeing is what is the direction of wave motions and what is the speed of the pulse? So we already saw it. If you have x minus vt, so I have you keep in mind, it doesn't matter. It's going to be vt minus x. doesn't matter. The point is, if the t and the x signs are opposite, you have a right traveling or positive x traveling waves. It's a x minus vt, or it could be minus x minus vt, doesn't matter, as long as the sign of x and t are exactly the same. You have the negative x traveling wave. So over here. You see, Bajan is X and T, they are going in the same sign. I mean, they have the same sign. So it must be negative X direction. Cool. Nice. What is the speed? Whatever numbers go in front of T. Five meter per second. And you are done. Okay. That simple. All right, guys. So I think this is a good place to take a break. And after the break, we'll take you to our main class of waves, which is, you can guess it. Yes. Go, I mean, coming from simple harmonic motion is going to be sinusoidal waves. And that right after the break. Okay. All right. So the point that we're going to use next is, all right, we're going to do the same thing that what we just did, but with the sinusoidal waves. Why do we want sinusoidal wave? That is because we want something simple. That's first of all, yeah. it's simple harmonic. So it's simple in form. And second of all, this is going to be the fundamental function that allow you to do some signal analysis or you know, mathematical analysis in the future based on sine and cosine function. Okay, so this is very important. So you can imagine that this is going to be your basis that allow you to do some more complicated analysis in the future as well. So that's why sinusoidal waves are super, super good. All right, so this is something that is very, very nice to know. However, before we get to that, and I just, you know, want to give you a good connection with wave that we're about to do over here. So I'm just going to send you a link that well, allow you to simulate, okay? Oh, I think I missed the link a little bit here. Okay, let me get that link directly to you here. So you guys can stop by this link. I forgot I should have put this uh, up before the break so you can, can just check it out. But anyway, so this is the uh, physics simulation website uh, by Colorado University. And it's been there for a long, long time. And that will give you it. Uh, you can execute it on right on there right away. Is a HTML5. So as you can see, the point of the waves that get the connections with the source is just this. This is a simple oscillation. You can play around with it. But as you can see, when I move my source up and down, that is my disturbance right there. The disturbance get propagated due to the interaction between the elements inside the medium. Does that make sense? All right, so that's what it is. Whatever you do at the source will get transmitted out. Okay, so if you do it one time, that's a pulse that we learned back in the day, and we know how to describe these functions in the two variable function x and t. Okay, but now what we are going to do here is now I'm going to turn this thing on and put it in an oscillation mode. And you notice something here? If you want to make things oscillating, what would be the easiest type of oscillation that you can come up with? Of course, it's going to be sinu I mean, sinusoidal. It's a simple harmonic motion. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so that's what you want. So what you're going to do over here is you assume on the left end, look at the tip 
of that rod or the bar right there, there is a green dot at the top of that bar. That green dot on the left is moving up and down, up and down in a simple harmonic motion. Okay. Okay, sounds good. And you can see that whatever the movement of the source is happening, that movement will get transferred into the weight and propagating out. Yes? Can I view that view as a, yes, you want. Yeah, exactly right. So if you look at the view down there, that is just exactly like a unit circle that we studied last time. So they are all connected. You can look from the circular motion. You can look from a unit circle. You map it onto a moving up and down in simple harmonic motion. And once you plot it out, you get a sinusoidal curve. They are all the same business over here. Cool. All right. And that's what exactly you want. And as I said, the waves never stop. So every time that you want to plot something, you want to capture something, put it on a paper, you have to stop the time. That's the only way. So you pick the time, everything will just, you know, being just a function of X. Cool. All right. And of course, if you fast, I mean, you have moved, step up the time a little bit, then you can see, you see what, I mean, let me move this one here. Okay. Oh, the end. this is what we do here. Look at this. So what I'm doing here is I move my time in step. So if I start everything from here, this is our sinusoidal curve. Start from zero, zero, right? But what you can think of is this is due to the simple harmonic source generating a simple harmonic waves. <laughs> think of it that way, yeah? Okay. And the simple, har har simple harmonic waves is just a sinusoidal wave. And if you start your time zero at this point, at later time, this sinusoidal curve will just move to your right. Right, right. Right, right, <laughs> right. See that? So this is our purpose. So I am going to put our sinusoidal wave and we're just going to animate that sinusoidal curve and we are done. Cool? Okay. You got to get the sinusoidal wave for the man. All right. So you can play around with this oscillation. I think it's very nice. You can play with the damping. Now we understand the damping a little bit. So let's try that one. If I put a lot of damp right there, even though it's not like simple harmonic damp or over damp, but that was it means like the amplitude will die down super quickly. And then you can decrease the damping coefficient a little bit. So you can have the lifetime of the wave a little bit longer until you don't have any damping at all. So the wave will just continue moving forever. Okay. And of course you can change the amplitude. Okay. It's a small amplitude. And then you can increase the amplitude, go crazy if you want. That is the A, the amplitude is the vertical displacement maximum, all right? And of course, you can turn the frequency down, and that will be super, super long wave because you move up and down slowly, or you can increase your frequency to make things slice up and down so fast. But one thing that you can notice is no matter how fast or slow you move your hands or your source up and down, See, the wave travel at the same speed. You see what I'm saying over here? See, I can change my frequency, whatever I want, but the speed of wave that propagating out depends on the environment. In this case, is a string. So you cannot change how fast the wave travel in the medium. That was being fixed by the property of the medium itself. Okay, so no matter how frequency, how high the amplitude, whatever you move these parameters around, the wave will just keep moving at the same value of speed, cannot change. Cool? The only way that you can change the speed, you just have to play with the tension. That's mean you adjust the medium itself. And we're going to talk about this toward the end, maybe of the next lecture, but not now. All right, but anyway, for us, let's focus on our sinusoidal wave. Let's animate sinusoidal curve, shall we? No, okay? Okay. Sounds like fun, yeah? <laughs> I don't know if it's fun or not. So here we go, guys. So let's look at the orange curve over here. Now, Adan, that's sine. Later, turns into the blue, but Adan, that's the shifting of the sinusoidal curve to my right. That's fine. Okay, we're going to do that. However, 
before we get to that, let's sort of like talk about terminologies a little bit. Okay. Notice one thing, Wajan. We are going to deal with the two variable function x and t. But then you are plotting in the two dimensional coordinates over here, x and y. So you have to be careful what you're writing right now. This is along the x. So that means you have to take a snapshot at every curve. So the yellow one or the orange one is at one particular time. The blue will be at another time. You guys with me here? Okay. All right. But anyway, at one particular point, look at the bottom figure over here. You take a snapshot, bam. And if you measure the distance from two points on the wave that look alike and then adjacent to each other, that distance separated by something that we're going to call it wavelength. That is a wavelength. Okay. You can measure any two points that look exactly the same and sit next to each other. That distance right there will be called one wavelength. Cool. The other distance that you have already known before, that's the maximum displacement in the vertical direction for our transverse wave. And that is our amplitude. Okay. So that's one. It's fine. But then we're done. We have the dimension in time. What does it really mean? Look again. So every time that now you see a plot into the plot like this, you have to be careful what is the horizontal axis is representing. In this case, see, now you would like to plot the height with respect to time. You get rid of x. So what do you do? You just do exactly what you did with time. Back in here, you say you freeze the time by taking a snapshot, right? Over here, you want t to survive. I mean, you want a function of t. Then that means you have to kill the x. So how to kill the x? You just fix a point. Take one point, pick a value of x. That means you stop at one particular point and observe how that wave is moving. Just to make things a little bit clearer, come back to our simulation here again. So this is animation perfect. This is two-dimensional functions, right? But then you say, hey, John, I want a function of time. So you have to fix the x. So let's take this one. For example, guys, take a look at the second green dot. If I say, hey, everyone, look at this, that means I already fixed the value of x. You guys with me here? Okay. And if you're just staring at the second green dot from the left, see? Okay, let me increase the amplitude here, make it more dramatic here. Look at the second green dot on the left. Or maybe too much. <laughs> All right, here we go. Look at the green dots on the left. It's only go up, down, up, down. See that? Up, down. <laughs> Is that that bad? Motion sickness. Okay. So imagine just like you are floating in the sea or in the ocean, and then you have the ocean wave passing you. So then you're floating. So you're just floating up and down, up and down, but in a fixed position. So if you would like to plot your vertical position with respect to time, what you are getting is going to be this curve right here. You guys with me? All right. So I hope you understand what does it mean by having the horizontal axis to be the position. You freeze the time taking a snapshot of that wave. If you want to plot against time, then you freeze the X. So it means you fix a position and then you just monitor yourself traveling in time up and down. Cool. All right. So. But anyway, it's sinusoidal in nature anyway. So you still get the sinusoidal curve. However, because the horizontal axis is talking about time. So if you measure the two points on the wave that look exactly the same next to each other, now the distance over here is not a distance anymore, but it's the interval in time. So it's the time that you complete one full cycle. So you call it a period. Okay. And of course, because period is time per cycle, if you flip it over, it's going to be number of cycle per unit time. It's going to be frequency, no doubt. All right. And the units of that is still in hertz, just like we already done it before. And one last stop, because we already know that it takes one wavelength for the wave to travel one perfect cycle. And it takes one period for the wave to move exactly one cycle. I can actually calculate the speed of wave by taking the distance over time. And you know, every one wavelength, it takes one perfect period. And because the period is just inverse of frequency, and that's it. You get this relationship right here. And I think you have heard okay. of this already. 
FM. So now just to confirm, this equation is not like a special equation for waves or anything. It's just distance over time. That's all. Okay. All right. Move on. So from now on, if you know the frequency or the period and you know the wavelength, you are able to calculate velocity of that traveling wave at all time. Cool. All right. Now let's make sine waves travel, shall we? <laughs> okay. It's time. All right. Maybe this slide, maybe, I don't know, it looks confusing and things like that. So I think maybe it's easier for us to go through this, you know, animation together, shall we? All right, so let me start by taking the form of the function that we have already learned before. You want just a snapshot of the wave that look like just a sinusoidal wave. So f of x is amplitude sine. And then because I want some flexibility in x, because I want to be able to you know, represent waves at any shape and form, I can just represent some constants in the front, shall we? All right, so that is just my sinusoidal wave. And for some of you, hey, Dan, can we be more general? Because we already learned about general solution and all this stuff. Yeah. Whoa, 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 something corrupted. <laughs> What's wrong? Okay, let me write it again. Why is it corrupted? Okay, anyway, so my snapshots go like sine. Kx. Now I want to do things sort of like more general. I can just add initial phase. You remember this dude here? Okay. All right. So this is as general as you want. Yeah, because every time that you have sine kx plus another term, you can always distribute everything and it has the sine and cosine in it. All right. But for us, all right, this is good. This is a sinusoidal waves. You can start your wave at any angle, phi zero. Okay. Guys. Please make it move for me. I want this side wave to travel to my right side, positive x direction with the speed v. What is going to be the shape of this one, guys? All right, nobody will be able to write that down. It's too long, so I'm going to write it down right now. <laughs> so here we go. I turn this into two variable functions, x and t. a is there, sine is there, k is there, and I just change x to x minus vt. That's what we learned today. Cool. That's it, guys. I'm done. Okay. Just, that's it for today. <laughs> just kidding. All right. But then we just have to do some interpretation of this one a little bit. But we already knew this is good. This form is good. This is the sinusoidal, sinusoidal waves already traveling to my right side with the speed V. But then let's ask, what is K? It must have some meaning though, because we're doing physics, right? So first thing first, what should be the unit of K? Because say, Ajahn, X is a unit meter and we have already learned whatever follows, sine, cosine, exponential, logarithm must has no unit, right? We already got that one. So because X is in meter, K must be in the unit of one over meter. Very good. But what does it mean? So it means like this. Mahjan, look at the argument over here. So every time that you change the value of x, one complete round or one complete cycle means one lambda. Okay? So that means when x go for one distance, I mean the distance of lambda, this, the wave already turned one full turn. But then because everything you're talking about is inside the sinusoidal function, one full turns mean two pi change for one cycle. So that means when x further away from you, one wavelength, that means the kx must already change by two pi. Does that make sense? The phi naught cannot be changed. It's just an initial phase. It cannot be changed or anything. So that means k. Lambda is two pi. Here we go. Make, with me, guys. So I just substitute x to be one perfect lambda. That will equivalent to two pi turns. And that means your k is two pi over lambda. And you are good. Okay. So what does it mean? It means knowing the k, knowing the lambda. It's just inverse of each other. But then you have the factor of two pi shows up in the front. 
and this one actually gets you the same feeling of what's next. Here we go. Look at this one, guys. Now I'm going to spray this one out on the right sign KX minus KVT plus phi naught. Cool. Look at the KV. Now, because I know K is 2 pi over lambda, V equal to F lambda. Lambda cancel with lambda. So you get 2 pi F in front of time. What is that? Okay. It's omega. Just like what we learned before in the circular motion or in simple harmonic motion. 2 pi F is just 2 pi over period. So what I'm saying over here is, of course, the coefficient that goes in front of time give you the omega, and the omega still look like 2 pi over period or 2 pi f. Cool? Okay. And now, comparing this with this, that's why they look very parallel. The omega, we call it the angular frequency, right? This one is angular frequency. This one, we call it the wave number. I mean, even though it doesn't go <laughs> hand in hand or anything, but the point is the angular frequency is the number of cycle in radian, because there's a factor two pi per unit time. That's why we call it sometimes when you study this in circular motion, you call it the angular speed, is the how fast you move in the angular sense. So is the angular frequency. So K is pretty much the same idea, but instead of talking from the perspective of a uh, perspective of time, you talk into perspective of lambda. It's how many cycle, <laughs> right? It's not frequency, but how many wavelengths that you can get over one cycle. You can call it like a, it's it's sort of like frequency, but it's a frequency in space. That's the whole idea. All right. So that's why the omega is the frequency in time. And the K is the frequency in space. I don't know, does that make sense to you at all? <laughs> all right, but at least the form of the formula are parallel to each other. And one for the X, the other for the time. There's two variable function right here. So that lead you to write down the grand conclusion for in another form, if you like, you can say now, your wave function for sinusoidal waves is a sine kx minus omega t plus phi naught, and you are done. Okay. Okay, and of course, I mean, I can do plus or minus, it doesn't matter. So, oh, maybe I just put it incorrectly here. All right, That's, it depends on the direction of motion. All right, so you can have everything turn to your right side, you pick the negative side. Everything turns to your negative x direction. The left-hand side, you pick the positive side. Very nice and cool. All right, so now come back to our slide. I hope you understand the whole conclusion. They are like now I already wrote down three forms. You can start from here. That's the original. Very cool. Dang dum, yeah? Okay. <laughs> you spot x minus vt. That is good. It must be a traveling wave. Yeah, or you can write out as what I just wrote down, kx minus omega t. Perfect, that's fine. Or, I mean, for some textbook, they don't want to use abbreviation k or omega at all. They just want to express everything, you know, in all forms. They can just split everything out, lambda and period right here with the two pi factor in the front. See, now you can see that three terms over here are three forms of your wave function are all talking about the same thing. It's just a traveling sinusoidal function. Okay. okay. Done, guys? Sounds good? Cool? <laughs> and what is so good about this is, can you notice something here? I think you don't even have to notice here. All of the characteristics of waves can be read from the right side of this equation. Come along with me. Amplitude A. K give you the wavelengths, omega give you the frequency or period, and that's it. So let me write it out here, 2 pi over lambda, this one 2 pi over period, or 2 pi f. But then these two, 
velocity is just f lambda. See that? So if you can read this one, you will know everything about this sinusoidal waves. Plus, you might be able to do a jan where you already use the k and omega. So why don't we just turn this f lambda into something that's maybe convenient to use right away? 2 pi f is omega. 2 pi over, oh, sorry. <laughs> lambda is on top, guys. Sorry. My bad, my bad. There you go. There you go. Okay. 2 pi f is omega. 2 pi over lambda is k. So you can also write v equal to f lambda to be equal to omega over k as well. Okay. Perfect. So that's it. Every information about waves is already built in into the right-hand side of this equation. You can read it out. Now you know how to read it. <laughs> okay. And what about okay. the left-hand side, guys? Just want to confirm one more time. So once you pick the x, once you pick the t, I mean, you pick both now, you substitute x and t into it. You are calculating y at x and t, right? So what is y? This is your transverse displacement. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, because that's what we have been talking all along. Everything that you are looking at right now is just the height of the medium that actually oscillating up and down. Okay, but now you get the full description of everything. Okay, all the information about waves is on the right-hand side of the equation. But once you pick the x and t, plug it everything in, you get exactly what should be the height of that element inside the medium at that time, at that value of x. Woo, is that good? This is very powerful, and I think this is like a wow, wow, wow moment, guys. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good because this one line of this expression tells you everything about sinusoidal waves. Isn't that amazing? Maybe. <laughs> All right, maybe just me. All right, guys, let's give it a shot and see. What kind of understanding are you going to get? Oh, but before that, I think I just misplaced this slide over here. So just to confirm, so now you understand what the Y means. It's just the vertical displacement, right? So that means you can calculate speed or velocity and acceleration by just as normal mean to do the derivatives. So that means once you take the derivative, you get the velocity. If you take the derivative of that speed, you get acceleration, right? So just look at this figure one more time. And I hope this is a conclusion of what we get to do today. Here, see? You have a string attached to the tip of a blade, okay? Oh, what's that? Are we missing a variable for dampening? <laughs> okay, we don't do damped, yes. All right, so don't worry about it, okay? <laughs> it's too hard. Don't damp it yet, yeah. But we can damp it if we want to. Just put like maybe exponential decay in front. Okay, All right, but not, yeah, not our problem. Very good, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so over here now, I hope you see the connections. Look over here, you have a blade, okay? And at the tip of the blade, you attach a string to it. And now you set the blade into motion. Maybe you pluck on it, so it just swing up and down, up and down. Bow, 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 bow. So that means if you look at the tip of the blade, this one will oscillate up and down in a simple harmonic motion, just like what we learned before, okay? All right. But then because at the tip of the blade, you do the connection with the string. So the string generate a sinusoidal wave going out, traveling to the right side. So this is where things get, I mean, just you, you have to make sure that you understand this whole thing right. There are two kinds of movements going on in the waves. Or if we talk in particular about the velocity, there are two velocity that you have to specify. One is the velocity of the wave traveling, which is in this case in the horizontal direction. And the velocity of the medium, or in this case, the tip of the blade, which is, is in vertical direction. Okay, that's why I would like to focus on a transverse wave because it's obvious wave traveling horizontally, but the medium or the source travel in the perpendicular direction in the vertical direction. So it's pretty much like, make sure that it's clear. These are two directions of motion. They're not gonna be able to you know, confuse between the two. But the point is this 
waves function over here gives you everything. This horizontal wave motion over here can be found from F lambda, which is backed into the K and omega. Perfect. But then if you want the simple harmonic motion, wherever this thing is, simple harmonic motion, simple harmonic motion, up and down, you take the Y, okay, which is the position first. And if you want to know how fast each element is traveling up and down, you do the derivative with respect to time once. With me? But then this is the thing, but then wait a second. You are dealing with the two variables function. But when you want to figure out the velocity, you have to take derivative with respect to time. And that's where your calculus comes into play again. Do you remember partial derivative? Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is the reason why you have to use the curly D just to say that, hey, I'm going to take the derivative with respect to time. I don't care about the X. I just let X go. <laughs> Treat X as just a number. All right. So that's why you do the derivative of sine. You get cosine. Do the chain rule inside. Treat X as a number, you get extra negative omega out in the front. And that's it. This is the reason why you get the expression for the speed equal to negative omega A cosine KX minus omega T. Okay, cool. And of course, you can do the same interpretation all the time. Whatever numbers comes in front of the sine or cosine, that gives you the maximum value. Cool. And then you do the derivative one more time. Take the V do derivative with respect to time again alone. You do partial derivative again. So derivative of cosine, you get negative sine, but then the chain rule give you another negative omega. So at the end, you get negative omega square A, sine kx minus omega t. Perfect. This one is exactly just like what we did with simple harmonic motion pretty much. Yeah, you take derivative twice, you get the acceleration. You get the original function or whatever. Okay, but anyway, my point is, this is it. This is how powerful this expression is, all right? For this particular one, we ignore the phi naught, of course. But anyway, the point is, from now on, every time you see this, A psi kx minus omega t, that's it. Okay. Traveling sign of And you're going to use this like crazy. <laughs> like, for those of you that are going to do like signal analysis, for those computer people, yeah, or you want to do like um, even complex waves or you want to do like voice recognitions or anything. I mean, usually anything that's vibrating, anything that started with the, something oscillatory in behavior, eventually you can de decompose those into summations of these simple sinusoidal waves. All right, for those of you that's I mean, haven't got to this far yet. Don't worry about it. I'm just, you know, give you a test of what is supposed to come in your future. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Oh, might become my problem later on. Yeah. Well, at least not in this course. So don't worry about the damp dampening coefficients or anything. So don't worry. Yeah. But maybe later on in your life, probably, yeah, if you would want to pursue this the whole thing further. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. So I hope that give you a pretty much like a good idea of, you know, sinusoidal waves. Everything is animated in front of your face. Waves never stop. But before we attack some of the examples, there's one thing that you can notice over here. If you look at the form, this is just maybe it's more like a trick, a tip, or, you know, some shortcuts or something. If you look at sine, which is from the Y and cosine, that is giving you the velocity. Every time you have sine and cosine, you know how to eliminate them. And the way that you can eliminate them is just using the identity of sine square plus cosine square equal to one, right? We already got this identity and used many, many times. So what I can do is I can take the y, square them up, take the speed in the y direction, the transverse speed, and square them up. And then now I can pretty much eliminate this sine square and cosine square. By having that, that means I eliminate all those crazy kx minus omega t from my equation. And that gives you the connection between the position 
and speed of waves directly. I mean, no, sorry, uh, the speed of the medium directly. So that means this expression right here, you can think of it just like a shortcut. Like, hey, I know where my medium is. I should be able to specify what it should be velocity. I mean, I know the velocity at that point right away. Okay, so this is kind of cool to have. Okay. And I have, I think, a couple of examples that utilize this relationship. All right, it makes things a little bit easier to calculate without going through sine and cosine function. Yeah, cool. Already, all right, let's, you know, do a couple of exercises, shall we? Just to make sure that we got things you know, nice and firm. And I think we're going to stop right here. And you guys can go back and focus on thermodynamics for our Sunday's exam. Sounds good? All right, now take a look at the first example and you will see how simple this thing is. Once you know how to read it. Uh, ocean waves with crest to crest distance of 10 meter can be described by the following function. Very good. I think everything is in SI system. What is the wave number? Wow, this is the original form as you can get. So whatever number is coming in the front, that is your K. And it's X minus, this must be V. Yeah, it's still in X minus VT form. So I can say K is 0.63. You can put the unit in there if you want. I don't need to put parentheses there, sorry. Yeah, yeah, cool. What is the velocity? Wow, velocity is easy, 1.2 meter per second. What is the angular frequency? All right, there are a couple of ways that you can do now because the omega, I mean, start from F equal to, I'm sorry, start from V equal to F lambda or omega over K. So that means omega is just V times K. You already got V and K from part A and part B. So it's just a product between the two. 1.2 times 0.63, the answer will be in radian per second. Cool? All right, or if you want, well, Ajahn, I can just distribute whatever terms that you have here, 0.63x, minus 0.63 times 1.2t. Do you notice something here? If I spread everything out, it will look exactly just like kx minus omega t. So omega is just these two terms anyway. Cool? Okay. All right, so now you know how to manipulate this or you know how to read this one out in whatever form is given to you. All right. Now, part D and E is easy and I'm not going to ask you this kind of question in the exam because you can plot or sketch things using software and all this stuff. So they, if they say what happens at time zero, that means you're going to get a waveform, right? Because we're going to freeze the time. That's it. So if you freeze the time, you get a function of X, plot it out. Freeze the time at two, plug it in, plot it out. Done. All right? Okay. Cool. Try one more and you will see how easy this one is. <laughs> I hope. All right. Try again, guys. Oh, oh, me two more. Okay, let's do two more, and I think we call it done. Is that one or two? Yeah, let's do two. All right, the string in the previous slide is driven by the frequency of five hertz. So previous slide is this one. Okay, the, this example that we did uh, with the tip of the blade there. So let's say that will give you the F equal to five. The amplitude of the motion is given, so that's the A. The speed of the wave is given, that's the V. Determine the angular frequency and the wave number of this wave and write the expression of the wave function. Woo! Shouldn't be too bad. All right. Are you ready? Angular frequency? <laughs> Omega is 2 pi f. 2 pi f is already given 5 hertz. So that's it, guys. It's 10 pi radian per second. No problem. What about the amplitude of the, I'm sorry, the wave number, the wave number is K is two pi over lambda. However, you already given the V, you already figured out the omega. So what you can do is, all right, V equal to omega over K. So that means K is just a ratio between omega and V. Omega is already found out to be 10 pi, the V, Speed of waves is given to be 20 meter per second, and that is pi and a half, one over meter. Cool. No problem. Okay. And now you know the omega and the k. Can you write down the expression for the wave? Well done. 
go for it, man. So it's F <laughs> X N T because this question is just like a loose question. They're not like specify which direction the waves is traveling. What is the initial position of the wave on and on? You just write down anything that has this characteristic of K and Omega. So just say A. Okay, let me write down the general form first. It's KX minus Omega T. Yeah, plus or minus doesn't matter. All right, so the expression will go for 1.2 meter. That's your amplitude. Sine or cosine if you want. KX, K is pi over 2X plus or minus omega is 10 pi t. And that's it, you are done. Okay. Okay, see? So once you know the, the shape, the form of the waves, you should be able to write down the wave function in full quite easily as well, yeah. All right, one last example, guys. And I think I can let you guys go. Okay. <laughs> A transverse. Yeah, just like I can hold you anyway. All right. A transverse wave on a string is described by the wave function here. Bam, bam, bam. Now you know how to read it. Determine the transverse speed and acceleration at time even, at point X even. Okay. And part B, what are the wavelength period and speed of propagation of this wave? Wow. This is going to be simple, I think, at this point. Can you figure out the transverse speed? But then the transverse, that's the vertical direction stuff, is just the partial derivative of y with respect to time. Ignore the x. I mean, ignore means you treat x as just a number. So all you need to do is just the take derivative of that 0.12 meter. Derivative of sine is cosine. Everything just like before. And then don't forget the chain rule. You do the chain rule in there you get extra four pi out. All right. And of course, now you can substitute T and you can substitute X in there and you're done. You know exactly what should be the transverse speed at that point in time. Cool. Okay. As the relation follows, transverse as the relation is just one more derivative of that speed with respect to time. Just differentiate one more time. Okay, you get four pi already once. Derivative of cosine, you get negative sine pi over 8x plus 4 pi t. Don't forget the chain rule. The chain rule will give you extra 4 pi out. So that's going to give you 4 pi square in the front. And once again, if you want the SR relation at that time, at that place, just substitute t and substitute x in there. You're done. And what about part b? So this is all part A. So for part B, you want to get the wavelength. Woohoo! Well done. Whatever numbers that go in front of X, that is K. So K is pi over eight. But now we know K is two pi over lambda. So that means my lambda is 16 meter. Cool. Okay. What about the period? We can read out the period by saying that whatever numbers go in front of X, that is omega. So omega is 4 pi, but then omega is 2 pi over period. Yes, so that means your period is just 1 half. Second. All right. Okay. And now, what is the speed of the wave propagation? Of course, combining these two, V equal to F lambda or omega over, <laughs> sorry, or lambda over period. And it's going to be just 16 over period. And that is 32 meter per second. And we are okay. officially done. Not bad, yeah? All right. So I hope, I mean, for the whole lecture today, I think my purpose is just for you to be familiar with this sinusoidal waves in totality. <laughs> Everything that you need to know about sinusoidal waves are already here. All right, both the propagation of the waves and the oscillations of the medium itself. Any questions? Sounds fun. I hope you learned something today. All right, guys. So if, I mean, any questions? All right. Cool. Seems like very nice and peaceful here. All right. So if not, then that is it for today's lecture, guys. Thank you for sticking around. All right.